Hi everyone, this is Jim Helwig from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I chair the U-Portal Steering Committee and I want to invite you or welcome you to the uh, U-Portal Community Call. It's been a little while but uh, we've been busy and there's a lot of exciting things to share. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to kick it off to the first of three Andrews that will be presenting today. So Drew, why don't you uh, take it away? You bet. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to kick it off by advancing to the first slide. Uh, <clears throat> here we have sort of the breakdown of the things that we intend to talk about today. Uh, not really any surprises, but a, uh, a fair amount of excitement. Uh, we're very happy to, you know, share news of the uPortal 4.2 release as well as uh, two uh, perspectives, two takes on some of the uh, most interesting, uh, you know, sort of new development in the pipeline in the um, in the uPortal community. So, uh, it, you know, that's essentially the breakdown. It's going to be me first, uh, you know, Andrew one or Drew, I guess, uh, talking about the uPortal 4.2 release. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Andrew Stewart, who is a, sort of a brand new Andrew for the community, uh, who will talk about work with CCC uh, in their, you know, innovative front-end uh, enhancements. Uh, and Andrew Petro will talk about uh, similar, uh, similarly innovative uh, front-end enhancements at the UW-Madison. Uh, and we'll wrap it up with some information about the upcoming conference, Open Aperio, uh, as well as um, sort of some next steps or some calls to action. So uh, it's me first. Uh, Uportal 4.2, uh, brand new as of last Friday, April 24th. I, um, uh, you know, burned the midnight oil a bit to make sure this got out last week like I intended. Uh, the full release notes, which contain uh, all, uh, sort of uh, links to all the uh, JIRA tickets that were closed, uh, JIRA tickets that are open that are known to affect uh, 4.2 and so forth, are contained at that URL in the, uh, in the Aperio Wiki. There's also a release page on GitHub. You can get to all the releases by, there's like a releases tab at the top of the page in the, um, the uPortal uh, main community GitHub repo right next to the commits tab. Uh, and 420 is the latest. There is, uh, you know, a fair amount of the same information there. The tag in GitHub uh, per our normal convention for this release is uPortal-4.2.0. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's some housekeeping, uh, but now I can point out that 4.2.0 is a new, a new minor version, and so it includes uh, new features. Uh, we have kind of shifted our practice in recent months. We have focused on releasing, uh, you know, we've sort of developed an intent to release more minor versions, to release minor versions more commonly and to uh, focus our, to put our new feature, new innovation uh, development into minor versions. And so this is one of those. Uh, and so we have plenty of cool new uh, goodness. In fact, there are uh, 112 JIRA tickets resolved for 4.2.0, and those are a variety of things, new features, bug fixes, uh, improvements to documentation, uh, all manner of things. Uh, and a last quick note before I move on to some of the highlights from 4.2.0. Uh, 4.2 is the first new portal that runs on Java 8. Uh, I don't believe it doesn't run on Tomcat 8 uh, quite yet. It doesn't run with um, Java 8 language features quite yet, but you can uh, run it in a, uh, you know, Java 8 JDK. Um, reading the comments here quick. Yeah, I, um, 
that's my fault, my bad. I uh, missed it, the release notes, but uh, James corrected them after I after I uh, put in that little miscommunication. Uh, all right, so uh, I have a number of highlights from the 420 release. A number of uh, you know, this is just a sample. There isn't enough time to cover everything cool that is new in 4.2, uh, but here are some of the most notable. Uh, Hover Chrome. We've actually had Hover Chrome for, uh, for a short time. We had Hover Chrome in 4.1, but we only had it for portlets that were in uh, regions, uh, like the logo portlet would have Hover Chrome if you're the admin user. It would allow you to access config mode for that portlet. But now we have Hover Chrome for portlets in the tab column hierarchy that have, uh, you know, that have no Chrome defined for them in the um, portlet manager. Uh, and this is great. This solves sort of a problem that we've had uh, in the platform for a while. We had this, this cool ability to, um, we had a, this cool ability to put portlets on the page that had no Chrome around them, but once you did them, did that, you couldn't remove them, you couldn't move them around, you couldn't uh, potentially access uh, edit mode, so it was sort of uh, limiting and confusing. But now for portlets that have no Chrome, we have, we have this Hover Chrome uh, capability that provides access to all those same uh, functions and also acts as the drop handle for drag and drop uh, personalization. The, um, Bottom bullet seems to be getting cut off a little bit on these slides, uh, but that's what that says. It acts as the handle for drag and drop. So a picture is worth a thousand words. This is what the Hover Chrome looks like in 4.2. On the left, you see uh, the options tab that appears when your mouse moves over the portlet. On the right, you see the same options tab, but once the user has clicked on it, the, the options that are available for this portlet are exposed, uh, are revealed. Uh, and like I said, you can use that same options tab, that, that gray area right there, to uh, pick up the portlet, to drag and drop it around the page, uh, even though it doesn't have normal portlet chrome. So that's uh, hover chrome for you portal 4.2. Next uh, highlight. Uh, a very significant reboot of the Portlet Manager UI. Uh, I'm sure most of you on the call are somewhat familiar with the Portlet Manager. Uh, I've known the Portlet Manager now uh, for an embarrassingly long time myself. You will remember that uh, it is set up sort of as a, as a workflow and a wizard. Uh, historically, you would click through several pages of options publishing a portlet. Uh, but in fact, uh, a lot of those options, you just wanted the defaults or, you know, they contain things that were seldom, seldom adjusted. So the portlet manager has been reduced, uh, has been sort of streamlined to a single page, mostly, to a, a nearly single page add edit interface, and we're going to see it in a second. Uh, the the input fields, the form fields, have become smarter as you start typing the title, which is the first field on the page. The name and F name fields start populating automatically. The name uh, starts populating identical to the title, and the F name starts populating based on an algorithm that converts all the characters to lowercase and inserts uh, dashes for spaces and other, uh, you know, non-character characters. Uh, non-alphabetic characters, non-alphanumeric, I guess. All right. Uh, in, additionally, in the single page interface, lesser known or less, lesser understood, lesser used options have been hidden into an advanced options slide down section of the, uh, of the page. They're all still there, but uh, they've been kind of hidden away because they're seldom touched and uh, they take up a lot of real estate, they create a lot of noise in the interface. Uh, but within that advanced options section, we used to have several different um, checkboxes for different styles of Chrome. You know, do you want no Chrome? Do you want alternate Chrome? Do you want highlighted Chrome? 
and they were, you know, essentially mutually exclusive Chrome styles or options, but they had been uh, modeled in the Portland Manager in the user interface, modeled as separate checkboxes, which was a little confusing. So we have consolidated the choice of Chrome into a single Chrome style uh, select drop down widget. Uh, and furthermore, another great improvement, uh, you know, as of uPortal 4.2, none, none of the above uh, is now a viable choice, allowable choice for groups and or categories. In the uPortal platform, we have been publishing portlets with no groups or categories or, or both uh, for a very long time. But until you portal 4.2, the only way to do that was by editing XML and using import export, uh, which, you know, is still a great way to do things. But now the uh, user interface actually reflects the allowable choices that are available for groups and, uh, and or categories, which is to say that they, uh, that none is an allowable choice. All right, so here's a screen capture of the new Portlet Manager UI. Uh, you'll recognize most of the stuff here, uh, all of the stuff here, I should think. It's just been consolidated into a single page, uh, you know, so less clicking, less noise on the page, because as you can see, the advanced options have been uh, sort of rolled up into an area that expands when you click on it. Uh, you know, sort of most of the time we're not dealing with those. The screen capture is sort of cut off at the bottom with the light cycle management, but that's actually the last uh, element on the page. So you set up, to publish a new portlet, you set up uh, title name and F name, and uh, ideally you only need to type one of those. You uh, enter an optional portlet description, uh, select your groups and categories, or leave them as none, click published, and then you're done on a single page. So it's uh, much more streamlined, uh, much faster, much more sort of approachable. Uh, there's a question, uh, what is the effect of having none for the group's value? Uh, the, the effect is that the vast majority of folks won't be able to, won't be able to access that portlet. Uh, but since it is permissions based, actually it, uh, portlet administrators will still be able to to find and use that portlet because uh, portlet administrator, or sorry, portal administrators automatically have all permissions. And this, uh, you know, the, the subscribe uh, capability is a permissions-based function uh, for portlet, so portlet administrators would still be able to see it. Uh, that might be something that you do if you're getting a portlet ready and testing it out among the administrators but not ready to, um, not ready to release it to the general public. All right, next highlight. Uh, uPortal now has a, a session timeout, you know, a client-side JavaScript-based uh, session timeout management warning dialog feature. Uh, when your this works with the uh, Tomcat configured or, or the viewportal web app configured session timeout, when your session as a user, your session is about to expire, <coughs> uh, the, um, that's a lot of seconds, but uh, when your session is about to expire, a dialogue like this, uh, Drew, it looks like you got disconnected, which means you might have to hit that talk button again. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, Andrew. Um, can you tell me quickly <laughs> where I was? You'd, I think, just finished talking about how it was configurable, and we're going to tell us about what it does. The session uh, timeout. Yep, sounds great. Uh, when your session is about to expire, you'll get a dialog like this. It will take over your screen. And if you, and typically it's configured to, to display for a minute prior to the timeout, but that point is configurable, that uh, amount of time is configurable. You just, um, the user can 
uh, you know, elect to stay logged in, or if the user ignores this dialog after a minute, uh, the user will be, you know, logged directly out of the portal uh, using the log out link. So the, you know, if the user goes to lunch and comes back, the screen will appear logged out. You won't see a portal screen and, and be tempted to start trying to use it only to discover that you don't have a session. All right, next highlight. This isn't a big item, but it is uh, you know, useful and cool nonetheless. We added a six column layout option. Previously, the, the largest, uh, you know, greatest number of columns available on a, um, on a tab was four. But uh, in, especially in conjunction with the app launcher style portlet, uh, of which you see several examples, uh, especially in conjunction with the app launcher style portlet and the work that's going on with our um, Illini Cloud partlet partners, it became clear that we could really use a, uh, a tab layout that had more columns. So we introduced a six column layout. Uh, and it, if you're interested in putting into your portal one or more tabs or pages that give you kind of a, a mobile dashboard uh, look and feel. Uh, App Launcher plus six column layout can, can really do it for you. In uPortal 4.2, furthermore, there were a number of uh, enhancements to the Portlet marketplace that is in the framework. Uh, the marketplace itself is, is not brand new. That appeared in uPortal 4.1, but if you uh, had the chance to look at it and, and um, kick the tires, you may have drawn the uh, conclusion that, you know, it was sort of at the prototype stage or a work in progress. That would have been, uh, uh, I think, a very fair conclusion. Uh, but in uPortal 4.2, that progress continues. Uh, primarily, there are a number of uh, cosmetic improvements which you'll see in a second. Uh, and those include uh, tighter integration or an integration with uh, Bootstrap 3 with responsive design and with the, uh, with the responder theme. Uh, there were some fixes to the support for the browse permission. Browse, of course, and we're going to see more about this in a few slides. Uh, browse is a new, relatively new permission in the, the uPortal uh, framework. It is, it is aimed at separating the notion, distinguishing between what a user, uh, portlets that a user can use if presented with the portlet, and portlets that a user can find and, and or add to his layout. Because we, uh, you know, we, talked, uh, you know, on many occasions and, so, and gradually came to the conclusion that if administrators give a, a portlet to a user by virtue of a fragment, uh, then the, those administrators want the user to be able to access the portlet on that fragment uh, and use that portlet. But there are many portlets that we don't actually want uh, users to find in the search or to browse for in uh, the customized gallery, or or likewise in the marketplace to find in the marketplace. Uh, that uh, a lot of those portlets are the ones that appear in regions that appear outside of the tab column hierarchy, uh, like the logo or the legal footer or the sign out button or the search launcher, which is the the widget in the top right. You know the the search widget where you type in queries in the top right. Those are all portlets in uh, the responder theme, but we don't, and we want users to be able to render them, and we want users to be able to see them on the page, but we, we maybe don't want users to be able to, um, to search for them and find them in the customize or, or browse for them in the marketplace. And we used to have a convention where if you didn't put those portlets in into a category that they would magically disappear. It was like one of those, uh, you know, best kept secrets of the uPortal platform. Uh, but that has, that practice has migrated, we've migrated away from that practice and we've instituted the browse permission 
for that purpose instead. We have the ability to, to specify which users can browse for or search for uh, a portlet specifically and distinctly from whether the user can use it uh, if it appears on the page. All right, well, enough about that. Uh, let me show you some screen captures. Uh, here is the sort of uh, preliminary, the list view screen of the marketplace updated in New Portal 4.2. You can see it's very bootstrappy. It's very, it's responsive. Uh, the um, sections at the top uh, do cool things with wrapping uh, as the display gets narrower. Uh, and the table in the middle does cool things in terms of losing uh, columns that are too big as the page gets narrower. That's the list screen. Here's the detail screen. The, um, there's more use of images here. You can see, you know, the logo in the top left. Uh, but probably the best thing about this screen is that now uh, in the Portal 4.2 in the marketplace, you have the ability to add a portlet to your layout, to your regular, uh, you know, tab column layout. And that's through the options drop down top right, which I've uh, shown expanded. All right, uh, just a couple more highlights. Uh, we added a new lifecycle state for portlets. It's called maintenance. It's similar to expired in that the user, you know, you put a portlet in maintenance, the user can't access it. But uh, the maintenance is different in that it's it leaves a box on the page with an out of service uh, message so that the user doesn't think the portlet just disappeared. The user uh, understands that the portlet is just out of service but will be back uh, in the in the future. Uh, thanks very much to KU for this enhancement. They sort of uh, helped us put this together and added it to the framework. All right, another highlight. Support for the Tin Can API or the Experience API. Um, I don't have a lot of personal exposure to this, but it, as I understand it, it's a um, you know an emerging or growing uh, standard to track, quantify, and share users' learning experiences with uh, you know using diverse systems on campus. The support for the Tin Can API extends on UPortal's existing events and statistics uh, subsystem. In order to use it, you need an external LRS. It's a learning record store. It's um, a, a, you know, a server that you're very likely to uh, stand up if you're interested in using the, um, using the Tin Can API. I think they all require it. Uh, you can enable uh, the Tin Can uh, API in, in portal.properties, but the configuration the, the fine tuning of it is in Tin Can API context.xml. All right, this one is really cool. Transient layout nodes for GIST users. Uh, for a very, very long time, dating back to early UPortal 2, uh, UPortal has had this notion of transient layout nodes. Uh, a transient layout node is a, a, a node, typically a portlet, that is added to your layout for a temporary uh, amount of time, uh, you know, for a period while you're using it, and then it disappears. Uh, that is, uh, you know, if you dial up a portlet that you uh, have permission to render uh, but is not on your layout, that is using a transient layout node. But ever since transient layout nodes have, have been with the framework, uh, there, there's been a significant limitation in that they weren't available for GIST users. So anything that an unauthenticated user needed to see in the portal had to be a part of, the, of that user's layout in some way. Uh, so that was sort of limiting in terms of, uh, you know, the content that you might put in your portal and send out a, a link to, even if it's not secure, uh, with, Brand new support for transient layout nodes. We can do really cool things, like we can have um, we can use the built-in uh, uPortal login form if we have a mind to, without putting it you know sort of directly on a tab uh, the way we used to have to. We can 
We could just put a link in the header for, you know, go to the login form. You click on it, and you would go to a URL like this. For this screen capture, I was care uh, careful to um, capture the, the address bar at the top, illustrating that this is, you know, slash u portal slash p login for accessing the login portlet directly. Uh, and this user is, is not signed in. Uh, so, so that's cool, being able to, you know, send out a URL or follow a URL directly to some non-sensitive content in the portal as a guest user. Uh, but perhaps uh, even better, perhaps the, the coolest thing about this is that now the uh, guest user can have the search widget uh, that, um, you know, text box in the top right where the uh, user can put in search terms and search for things in the portal. The reason that we we never had that for the guest user, um, you know, historically was because we didn't we couldn't support transient layout nodes. The when you click enter on that search box, when you use that search box, you're bringing up the search portlet in a transient layout node, and it just wouldn't work for guest users. Uh, but now, uh, owing to this uh, very cool enhancement, we can we can do that. All right, uh, very close to the end here for me. Uh, there are a couple configuration changes in Core 2 that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is the switch in the default PAGS implementation. We've had, since ePortal 4.1, we've had a new style of PAGS group called JPA or Entity PAGS. This uh, approach to PAGS, this flavor of PAGS, is configured using the database, configured in the database. Um, you know, the PAGS groups themselves are database records. Instead of configured in uh, what is it, P uh, PAGS group store config.xml, uh, instead of configured in a single XML file. The uh, advantage of this, there are a number of advantages of this switch, and they're similar to the advantages we experienced when we made, when we made the same transition with DLM. Now you can create or modify PAGS groups without taking the server down and rebuilding the portal. Uh, so that's an advantage. And furthermore, because we can do that and because they're stored in the database, we now have the ability to start building user interfaces, uh, you know, administrative interfaces into the portal that manipulate or add to uh, PAGS groups. Uh, and some of that kind of thing is already happening in the multi-tenancy area, uh, but more of that is, is in the pipeline. Uh, so, in point of fact, the, only the default has changed. The uh, legacy or the previous PAGS implementation uh, you know, still works just as well as ever. So, in moving to Core 2, if you have the previous PAGS, you can move that configuration forward and it will work no problem but you may want to consider making the switch because new features that are, you know, coming through the pipeline uh, take advantage of the, uh, of the new database PAGs. Last item, uh, this is a change that uh, could potentially be a bit of a gotcha uh, for, for upgraders, so uh, watch out for this. It's easy to correct, but vi uh, visibility in the customized gallery and search results as well as in the marketplace, uh, visibility on portlets is now exclusively handled, exclusively governed by the browse permission. So if you're migrating portlet definitions forward from a previous version of the um, uPortal framework, you might want to add uh, browse permissions to those portlet definitions. You can see you know, loads of examples in the current code base. Uh, because otherwise users may not be able to find, may not be able to find those portlets. Uh, all right, I think that's my last slide, except for I want to take this opportunity to plug uh, the Getting Started with uPortal 4.2 seminar at Open Aperio. It's going to be Sunday, May 31st in the morning. It's scheduled for 9 a.m. Uh, it's led by me, co-presented by 
Andrew Petro, uh, I forgot to add this to the slide, that's a, a late addition. But Andrew and Andrew um, on uPortal 4.2, uh, it, it is geared towards those thinking of adopting uPortal for the first time and thinking of upgrading to uPortal 4.2. It's, you know, really for both audiences. Uh, there's a longer list of topics in the, um, you know, in the schedule, the published schedule, but, uh, you know, quickly, the, we are definitely going to cover data migration, definitely going, going to cover skinning uh, with Responder because it is uh, very, it, it's both different and cool. Uh, and we're going to cover, uh, you know, new and, and emerging strategies for portal content because there's a lot of great information there as well. But uh, all the traditional things that we cover in adopting uPortal, like authentication, user attributes, and groups and permissions, layouts, we'll be covering those things as well. All right, uh, that is the end of it for me. I'm going to hand off to Andrew number two, Andrew Stewart, uh, who is going to talk to you about work that's exciting work that's happening with uh, California Community Colleges. All right, take it away. Okay. Uh, so as Drew mentioned, I've been working with California Community Colleges over the last couple months, I guess. Um, and uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was make sure that the portal would be ready for um, for mobile users especially because they have a lot of, um, you know, of users who come to them on mobile. Um, and one of the things I've always enjoyed um, over the last, well, I guess over the last couple of years is working with Angular. Um, so we wanted to see if it would be possible to bring Angular into the portal, um, which would be a, a bit of a change from, from the traditional um, full round trip, full refresh. Um, the goals of, of that um, endeavor would be to, as um, on my slide you can see, improve the UX by eliminating unnecessary round trips um, by just caching the uh, responses that we get from the server, we've been able to, to vastly increase the, the, um, the speed of going in between tabs. Um, and especially you'll see that benefit on mobile where you get about 400 millisecond round trip time for every call back and forth to the server, which can, you know, go crazy when you have script files you need to load. So on top of that, we obviously don't want to throw out everything that's already in the, the portal, the existing render and infrastructure and customization for administrators. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we kept that um, as well as portlet compatibility. So if there's portlets out there, we don't want to just have to toss them out or rewrite them um, just to be able to migrate them into this Angular portal. Um, and then on top of that, we want to make sure that as we're building this, we're also making sure that um, the tools and the, the patterns we build are reusable by other people so that if you want to build a UI from scratch, you don't have as much uh, to write from scratch. Um, so for those of you familiar with Angular, that means services, directives that can, um, that you could just drop into your own code and, um, you know, have a bit of a running start to, to build your own portal front end. Um, and then also we want to poise uPortal for progressive enhancement, meaning if a portlet wants to expose a way to, um, you know, just start talking data back and forth to the front end rather than full HTML, um, we want to be able to, to start being able to do that. Um, so um, progress so far, what we have is a kind of a working prototype. Um, it's a separate site right now still. We haven't integrated it back into an actual theme for uPortal, um, but that should be coming soon. Um, we built a pattern for using Angular in portlets, making sure that you're not squashing, um, reloading Angular multiple times, um, making sure that you're hooking in and lazy loading your dependencies, um, which kind of helps to, to make sure that, because um, I, I don't know if for anybody who's used Angular before, if you try to load it twice, that'll get you into some trouble. Um, we built sort of a, a standards document, I guess, if you will, just um, kind of a living document uh, that as we find more caveats and as we find more patterns that you have to follow, we're going to be updating that. Um, right now, it's, I, I don't think we have it out on the community wiki, but that is a goal in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully next week, once I'm back, um, can get that out there. 
And then uh, we do have some initial work towards making that prototype into an actual theme for uPortal. We've done some work on the layout.json call um, so that we get all the, the metadata information we need. And um, we've got a kind of a, a shell uh, built out for a theme so that we can, uh, can build on that. So what have we done? Um, as I mentioned before, we have some safeguards making sure that Angular is not loading itself twice, uh, just kind of checking the, the global namespace, see if Angular is there, and then follow kind of a, a require JS-like pattern for loading Angular if it is there or if it's not already there. Um, we have a, I guess you could call it a directive in Angular terms, basically just a comment that you put at the top of any portlets that do have Angular in them. So that if there's an Angular portal out there, it knows that it needs to compile that in an Angular way so that, uh, again, you're not bootstrapping twice and you're not running into those issues. Um, and then uh, the portlets will either bootstrap to their own, basically, Chrome shell so that they're not um, conflicting, or they're going to register their dependencies with that predefined um, loader, which is in a well-known name. It'll be probably something under the UP JavaScript object, which I've seen in, in a lot of portlets that they use. Um, and again, that lazy loader is going to make sure that code isn't loaded twice, so that if you have a directive under the same name, it's not going to try to hook itself up twice to any, uh, any DOM elements with that name. Um, but we're hoping to have a little bit more of a proactive solution for deduplicating those dependencies um, proactively so that, that we're not even making the HTTP call twice. Um, and lastly, the, some of the things remaining, we want to migrate to using the history API. Um, for those of you familiar with HTML5, that'll enable us to actually have um, non-hash-based routes, and we can hook into a lot of the existing um, or well, not hook into, but we can use a lot of the existing links and JavaScript um, without having to modify it because the browser is going to redirect those calls to, to JavaScript rather than actually making a new HTTP call. Um, and that will require some modification for request routing on the actual portal um, because we're going to need to make sure that, that if that's an actual initial call, it still returns the, the JavaScript and the, the, the application that that the browser would expect. Excuse me. And uh, lastly, as I mentioned before, we want to make sure that we have a way not to um, make duplicate requests when possible. Uh, we're looking into require.js as a possibility there just to be able to say, hey, I need this. Um, I need this directive. I need this service, or I need this library for um, my application to work. And then require.js can make sure we're deduplicating um, sorry, I just noticed the comment about the speed, yeah. Um, all right, so, oh, last page. Um, so to, uh, yeah, we want to make sure also that the, that the portal is able to reset state if there does need to be a full, re full page refresh, that we're not completely losing that, um, that existing state. Um, also be able to track the window state changes for the portlet. Um, and as I mentioned before, we want to do progressive enhancement. Um, and uh, as Andrew Petro will, will talk about, I think, in a little bit, or, or as you may have already seen, I'm not sure, um, some of the work that they've done um, is very similar to this. And I think this would be a great point uh, to integrate some of the work they've done with some of the work we're doing. Um, and finally, as I, I mentioned before, this is a prototype, so we do have some cleanup and polish we'd like to do. Um, as far as CCC, there's still ongoing design work being done, so it's kind of hard to get all that polish put in when we, we don't exactly have a, an end direction yet. So um, I'll, uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and show off a little bit what we've done, because obviously that's a little easier to understand and see um, than just a bunch of bullet points. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, but what you can see right now, this is just a, a JavaScript application. It's actually running in. Um, it's just being served uh, static HTML through um, Tomcat. 
And um, as you can see there, I've got the hash routing. Um, so this is uh, pulling up different folders. These uh, that you can ignore that. Sorry, <laughs> that piece is currently broken. Uh, but those would be a bunch of app launchers. Um, and these are all actual portlets being rendered by uPortal right now inside of Angular. Um, and they're actually being rendered through a call to exclusive mode. Um, and then you're able to, to bring that into a full page experience. Most of them um, are working right now. There are some issues uh, where a lot of uh, a lot of the existing JavaScript code, or, or some of the existing JavaScript code, expects a full page refresh. So it's got like an, a document.ready hook, um, and that doesn't necessarily fire. So um, we're hoping that that's taken comp care of almost completely when we move to uh, the hash-based routing, or the um, sorry, the HTML5 routing. So this is uh, obviously this is an existing portlet that's out there. Um, and over here, I have an Angular portlet um, that's being compiled separately and registering its own dependencies. Um, and you can see that loads fine, and I'm able to edit all the, the information here. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, but I think that's probably about it. Um, yeah, I don't know if, there, uh, if there's any questions. I'd be glad to answer. Um, I do have to take off shortly, though, so hopefully um, I don't think I see anything. So I guess we can move on to Andrew Pichot then. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. so I suppose I could hit the next placeholder side, and then more importantly, I need to share some stuff. All right, so I should be sharing my browser now. Everybody see that once it loads? I'll take that as yes. Excellent. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is that the code I'm going to show you uh, is uh, genuinely available open source software. And not only is this uh, genuinely available software um, that's either you know, in production here or is somewhere in our migration path to production. But uh, there's this very fancy um, Code Envy launcher uh, right off of the README on the, on the publicly available repo for this. So if you were to, say, click the little launcher thing, uh, then that would launch you into Code Envy, which is this software as a service development environment thing. And it'll go ahead and uh, fork and import a copy of this project or so. And then you push the little green button over here to run it. And then um, it'll do things. And that'll take a minute or two. So while it's doing that, I'll talk about some other stuff. So uh, what are we talking about here? Um, what we're talking about, which, where's my pre dev tier? I'll stop clicking around now and let it render. So um, what I'm talking about here is our, our beta you know, implemented in AngularJS uh, client side um, landing page for, for my UW. And so you know, what we, we have a, a mature, um, why are we getting an echo? I can't think of a good reason why we would get an echo. Um, is that any better? All right, let me do the best I can here. Uh, if my computer's not muted, yeah, but did I get the headset? All right, do what I can here. So uh, we have a mature, you know, 10-ish year old portal with like 180 portlets. Um, and what we wanted to do was provide a, a new, faster, more responsive uh, user experience, especially for you know, how it feels when you log into the portal and land there. And so um, close my downloads thing, yes. OK. Right. So, uh, so what we have here, we got a couple modes, right? So there's a simpler mode. The feedback has been really interesting in that half the people seem to really like an experience that looks like this right here, where I log into the portal and I get 
a list uh, of, of these you know, links to the stuff I most want to get to, and I can scroll down to more stuff, and I can search for more stuff. Um, and uh, my courses, and I can uh, you know, get details about my stuff. Uh, this is a take on the, the marketplace functionality that you get in, in um, out of the box U Portal 4.2. And so half the people are pretty happy with that, and that's cool. Um, but maybe half the people said, wait, 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 I thought this was a portal. I thought we were going to get you know, useful content right on the landing page. And uh, where we've been going with that is implementing these, these smart widgets. Um, but I want to emphasize that uh, you know, we, this, behind this new AngularJS UI is uPortal. Um, we have an investment in existing portlets, and we need to support those portlets. In fact, this very uh, conferencing session that you're looking at Right here, um, ignore the weird artifacting on my screen. It's because I zoomed it. Um, this was actually provisioned and launched from uh, the web conferencing portlet in our portal, um, which integrates with Blackboard Collaborate. So that's kind of some, some nice self-referential dog fooding here. But my point is, this is rendering a, a JSR, I think it's a 286 portlet, uh, you know, from this Chrome, from this portal. So, so what happens when you click on these links is, you know, where appropriate, you're still launching a portlet, um, or maybe you're linking out to, to something external if that's the right thing to do. Um, I'm peeking up at my list of things I wanted to talk about. Yes, so we've got these exciting new smart widgets, which is a, a way to get some dynamic content right on this new responsive uh, landing page. And if you are an interesting user, like say a real actual student, then your widgets are more interesting. Uh, for instance, we got this, this courses widget that um, you know, pops you up the, the list of your courses, and then that links into the My Courses portlet. Um, or likewise, everybody likes the weather, so, so here we are with a, with a weather app. Do, 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 do. Um, and we've got some neat tooling for generating uh, a widget. Uh, we wanted to make this easy to develop. So um, I'm not sure this portlet can actually change lives. But uh, if you did want to build one of these smart widgets that was you know, a list of links, that's cool. Um, you've got a template for that. And importantly, these are backed by JSON. And so what makes them dynamic and interesting is that the backing JSON, instead of being static example JSON, could be coming from, from a servlet or so. Um, and then once I've got that, then I can, can render it. So here's a nice tool for building these things. Also open source. Um, and by this point, my code envy thing should have booted. Here we are. Um, that took, I guess, eight seconds there is what that was. But anyway, um, so I launched this thing, and then I have to remember to go to the right context in it to get it to render. Uh, but ta-da, here we have our AngularJS front end for uPortal um, rendering out of that, that code envy instance, you know, not depending on or talking to uh, any UW Madison you know, artifacts or resources at all. So that's pretty cool. Um, do, 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 do. So anyway, that's that's what we've been working on uh, is a, a alternative, you know, front end for that that landing experience of what happens when I log into the portal and how do I get more content? How do I, you know, search for content and what does that feel like and how do I launch this content? Um, and and this is available open source software that you can jump in, jump into and play with. But you might want some help with that. And for purposes of that, if I stop sharing here and go back to the slide where, um, I can point out that uh, we're going to give a seminar about this at the uh, Aperio conference, uh, hands-on. Uh, working with 100% you know, available, real, open source software. Um, and it's the stuff that we're delivering either in production or working on delivering on production. Uh, this is a new you know, responsive front end uh, that is backed by 
uh, web services and genuine you know, rendering of portlets that's being provided out of the, the U portal that we all know and love. Uh, so that's what that is. Um, peeking over in the chat, I guess I've talked fast enough that there are no questions because no one could understand what I was saying, which is probably fine for now. Um, Drew, did you want me just to go ahead and go through the rest of the slides about what I the think conference? that would be a good idea. I think we're looking at about eight minutes. So if, if that takes about half of that or a little more, we might have a couple minutes for questions. And I know I can stay on a little late. Perfect. This sounds good. So besides the, so here's what you do at the conference. You make sure to come early for the seminars because there's the uPortal 4.2 seminar in the morning and you need your uPortal 4.2. And then there's our seminar in the afternoon, which is the new front end, which is a front end for uPortal 4.2. So, so these connect together really well. And then you've got a whole day of, of seminars packed in. Um, and then you have the rest of the conference, which is packed with goodness. Uh, we've got uPortal flavored goodness in terms of, of presentations about uPortal and pretty closely related to uPortal, you know, the, the generic state of the portal, talking about notifications, talking about multi-tenant portals, um, talking about where are we going with, with this product. So that's pretty cool. Um, we've got U-Mobile goodness. Uh, so if, if you wanted a different seminar on that first day, there's a half-day seminar about U-Mobile, which is a, a, a mobile app that is backed by, by U-Portal. So it's spiritually similar to what we're doing with an AngularJS front end you know, that's backed by U-Portal, but this is a, a native mobile app that's backed by U-Portal. And so there's content about that. And there's portlet goodness, uh, so there's a showcase uh, of great portlets, and there's uh, a presentation I'm really excited about, about how to use Clojure to write portlets. I think that'll be really cool. And then there's a presentation on, on how to go beyond portlets and, and you know, what, what comes next after portlets. So that's pretty cool, too. Um, yeah, the whole day of seminars, it's, it's two by three, three hours, that's true, so it's totally survivable. Um, and then uh, there's a couple other loosely related presentations uh, that I wanted to mention because I think part of what's driving our redesign is you know, being attentive to the user experience and to, and to you know, responsive, um, accessible, usable design practices. And I think that's, that's something maybe everyone's more and more interested in. And so there's some content about, about that and kind of that angle on your portal. And that gets us to the last slide, which is the call to action. So here's what you should all do. You should come to the conference. You should attend the seminars. You should upgrade to uPortal 4.2, or at least try and figure out what needs to be smoothed out so that you'll want to do that. Um, and you should hop on the email lists and talk about all of the above. Yeah, Benito, I'm really looking forward to that, uh, that closure presentation. So. Uh, Pressure's on. <laughs> I think with that, we have a few minutes for questions. And Drew mentioned you'd stay on a little for questions if they arise. I'd, I'd be happy to do that, too. I think a lot of people would be happy to do that. Oh, good call, whoever hit next. So uh, in terms of follow-up, I think this recording will be somewhere. I think we could probably figure out how to put the slide deck somewhere. It's, it's in Google Docs. I bet there's some way to publish a link out of that. Um, uh, I see contact information there for the steering committee, which is, which is a fine thing. That's kind of the organization sponsoring, hosting this webinar. Um, I guess I'd also encourage discussion of all this stuff directly on the the uPortal user and uPortal dev lists, I think is really where a lot of this belongs. Comments about multi-tenancy changes in 4.2. Drew, I think that's firmly you. Yeah, I, I suspect you're right. Um, so what I can say about multi-tenancy, I'm just kind of gathering my wits here. Uh, there were 
close to the end of development on 4.2, there were some breakthroughs uh, and some, uh, mostly in the area of uh, bug fixes uh, in the multi-tenancy area, in particular in the way that, um, so the way that multi-tenancy typically works, at least the way it works with the Linux cloud, is that when you create a tenant, there are certain entities, there are certain portal database records that are created automatically to model uh, the tenancy. And this is, it really can be anything you want, but it starts with uh, some PAGS groups and also includes, you know, some layouts and some portlets and fragments and, and so forth, some permissions uh, that get uh, created automatically uh, when you hit that, you know, button to create a new tenant. Uh, and the the version of that that was available, the version of the tenant manager that was available in 4.1 had, had this feature, uh, but there were some gotchas. Uh, there were some behaviors of that that weren't quite working as expected, you, some things you had to kind of work around. Uh, and furthermore, it was, um, it included, I didn't mention this, but it included, uh, that, that capability included the, uh, an ability to use Spring EL, Spring Expression Language uh, Expressions, uh, inside of these entity documents so that you could create these, these groups and portlets and layouts or whatever, uh, and part of the names of these uh, things would be static. You know, um, if, if your tenant is uh, law school, you might end up with a law school uh, administrators group, a law school uh, users group, a law school um, editors group, a law school students group. Uh, and then the next tenant, if you created a, you know, a dental school, you would get a dental stu uh, school students group, a, a dental school administrators group, and so on. So uh, these entities, portal entities, uh, were being generated, uh, you know, in the running portal environment by a combination of static uh, stuff that was defined, you know, in, in essentially entity files like import-export, you know, as usual. But mixed, in, mixed into these were uh, some spring expression language expressions that would be evaluated based on the metadata evaluated and replaced based on the uh, metadata defined for that tenancy. Well, this whole, uh, you know, spring expression language capability was in, for one, it was something that was, that was tightly coupled and only available in the tenant manager itself. In 4.2, all that, you know, spring expression language capability vis-a-vis uh, import export has been moved out of the tenant manager area of the code base and into the import export area of the code base so that in in the future uh, more things that use import export will be able to use this expression language capability. Uh, this will give us the ability to have one set of sort of quick start entities documents that maybe have some expressions in them that uh, get evaluated at import time based on values that are defined in like local.properties or prod.properties or dev.properties in, in the environment specific filters files, uh, which is kind of cool because uh, we haven't been able to do that uh, historically. Uh, yes, so to answer that question, I'm not sure it's exactly the answer you were looking for, but the, the primary work inside multi-tenancy features that I'm aware of uh, has been pretty recent, and it was uh, it fixes, you know, fixing some bugs, some, you know, poor handling of some corner cases in the, um, you know, entity import capabilities of, of, of multi-tenancy uh, together with refactoring this important spring expression language capability out of the tenant manager area and into the, the main import export area where it belongs.
more questions about um, uPortal 4.2 features? I, I know that was, uh, you know, a half an hour ago, but uh, either about the highlights that I mentioned or maybe the um, any questions about those configuration changes? Let's see here. So uh, as long as I've got your attention, uh, I actually, uh, uh, I mentioned this earlier that we would be able to add the search wi widget to the guest experience uh, and realizing in the minutes before, um, in the minutes before this call that we had talked about that but never done it, uh, I went ahead and made that change uh, this morning. Uh, so here I am as the guest user in the portal, and I can search for something that I know exists, like Portlet. Drew, I suspect you need to like move that window. Um, I can't see your your screen share for one. Yeah, you got to move it. Is it helping? I can't tell. Is that doing anything? Um, starting to. I think it needs to be on the same monitor the same screen with your um, Blackboard Collaborate. That, that's a valuable insight. Yeah, at the moment, I'm, I'm currently using exactly one screen. Hmm. Well. All right. Well, I, I, um, I honestly don't need to uh, screen share it. I, I can just mention it. I have no idea why that didn't work. Well, there's something. Yeah. No. There we go. Right. That's what I saw, for whatever that's worth. Um, triaging the, the questions in chat, and maybe top of the list here was, um, what is the browse in the Portlet definition file? And it looks like James Winmacher already tried to answer that in chat, which is great. Um, yeah, the, the short version is that you know in the Portlet definition file for a long time it's been it's been very convenient to be able to you know declaratively configure right there you know what groups have permission to use a Portlet and under the hood that was a, a permission that's technically called subscribe um, and what what the browse permission has done is introduced a complementary permission, right? So one permission, you know, subscribe, is about your ability to render the portlet and, and by extension your ability to have the portlet in your layout you know, to subscribe to it. A, a different way of thinking about access to content is the ability to be aware that the content exists, to, to browse the content. And that's what the browse permission is. And it's intended to model your ability to to see the content in the marketplace or in the in the customized drawer, um, and if you think about it, you know there, there's there's some kind of technical content, um, um, you know the, the search bar, the random stuff you stick in regions that that users have permission to use, but they don't really need to be finding it in search results, and they don't need to be they don't need to be you know browsing for it, uh, and and so they might have subscribe but not browse on that. And then likewise the other way where you know, we found it at UW Madison that we have some use cases where we have some users who need to be aware of some content even though they're not in the target audience to use the content. So, so maybe a, an academic advisor you know, needs to be able to, to find and see and understand you know, what is the stuff that's available to his or her students even though that stuff is not genuinely renderable by, by that user. And so anyway, the, the browse in the Portland definition file, uh, in a way similar to, but not exactly the same as you know, the, the way you would declare the, the groups who can, can subscribe to it, you can now declare groups that get other permissions. And the only interesting permission is, is browse. But, but at least in theory, you could actually grant other permissions. Uh, right there from the portlet definition file, so you don't have to be screwing around with separate entity files representing that permission grant. 
I, uh, Andrew, I, I believe that means that you could configure right there in that file the groups who are allowed to enter config mode for that portlet. Exactly so. Uh, and these days, uh, you know, ever I don't think it's since uPortal 4.2, I think it's since uPortal 4.1, uh, users can enter config mode on a portlet directly from the Chrome, directly from the portlet Chrome. They don't need to go through the portlet manager to do so. Right. I, I should say users who are authorized to do it, they can do so. Yeah, this this lets you, you know, in a rather tight way, you know, grant configuration capability over a few or a single portlet without having to grant, you know, plenipotent access to the to the portlet manager, as it were. Skimming the, the chat, um, Aaron Grant, I think, was asking about API changes um, in 4.2. I don't have a good answer to that offhand. Do you, Drew? Uh, I, I'm not aware of, um, let's see, there's layout v2, but did, isn't layout v2 still sitting in a pull request? Possible. I, yeah. I, I think it is. Uh, so, so in general, I think there were changes and additions to the to the JSON you know, web service APIs out of the portal. That's that's one area of change. I, I don't believe there was I'd, any I'd have to go look at the changes. I don't think there was any, you know, backwards compatibility breaking changes. There might be more metadata coming. Yeah, let's break all the APIs for, for uPortal 5, um, which is a very bad segue to that next question in the chat um, about what we're thinking about for uPortal 5. I mean, I guess in seriousness, uPortal 5 is an opportunity to to change some APIs where it's worth doing. I think you know, my perspective is, is uPortal 5 becomes a version where uh, it, 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 uPortal's had an interesting trajectory where, where once upon a time we had channels and we were a container for channels, and now we're we're more or less a container for portlets. And and where I see, you know, where I for one see this going, is in uPortal 5 we become a container for for experiences that are not portlets. Uh, that that the portlet support continues. That, that many of us have these rich portlets that we need to continue to have, you know, by all means. But uh, uPortal kind of burst the boundaries of, of what portlets let us do and we start doing something much lighter weight and 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 snappier. I didn't get to, to demo it. Uh, it. It wasn't top of the list for the chunk of time I had. But another thing we're working on, of course, is beyond the smart widgets, um, you know, being able to build whole experiences that feel like portlets. Uh, but, but in fact, they're implemented in this new client-side Angular JS way, um, and so they feel like they're part of the portal, but there uh, there are no portlets involved. Uh, I'm uh, reading James' comment in the chat, and I, um, you know, want to echo his, uh, you know, his thoughts. Uh, for me. Even on this call, we've seen two two takes on a more modern, you know, less full page, fewer full page refresh, uh, Angular based uh, portal front end. Uh, I think you, you, for me, you portal five. Uh, the primary thing that I expect is a, um, you know, sort of a reboot of Responder, Angular based, uh, more modern. I think we're 10 minutes over, and I think we're out of questions in the chat. Should we um, 
should we think about tying this off and emphasize that that all these questions and more should be uh, should be raised on the email lists and let's continue to go after them there. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do that and bring them to the conference. Thank yep. you to uh, all of you, Andrew, today for uh, presenting. And we'll work on getting uh, this archived and um, online for everybody that wasn't able to make it.